This is Come Follow Me Lesson number 28 for July 3rd through the 9th, and it's based on Acts chapters 1 through 5, and the theme is You Shall Be Witnesses Unto Me, The Growth and Development of the Church of Christ. Have you ever wondered what Peter might have been thinking and feeling when he, with the other apostles, looked steadfastly toward heaven and Jesus ascended to his Father? The church that was founded by the Son of God was now in Peter's care. The task of leading the effort to teach all nations now rested on him. But if Peter felt inadequate or afraid, we don't find any evidence of that in the books of Acts. What we do find are examples of fearless testimony and conversion, miraculous healings, spiritual manifestations, and significant growth for the church. This was still Christ's church and still led by him. In fact, the book of Acts of the Apostles could also be called the Acts of Jesus Christ through his apostles. Guided by an outpouring of the Spirit, Peter was no longer the unlearned fisherman Jesus found on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, nor was he the distraught man who only weeks earlier was weeping bitterly because he had denied that he even knew Jesus of Nazareth. In the book of Acts, you will read powerful declarations about Jesus Christ and his gospel. You will also see how that gospel can change people, including yourself, into the valiant disciples God knows they can be. The book of Acts. It's the second volume of a unified two-part work that today we call Luke-Acts. These were written by the same author, Luke, who was a traveling co-worker with Paul. This is clear from the book's introduction, where Luke says, I produced my first volume, that's the gospel, about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now Luke's giving a clue here as to what this book of Acts will be about. Volume 1 was about what Jesus began to do and to teach. Volume 2 will then be about what Jesus continued to do and teach. Which leads to a really interesting point about the book's traditional but not original name, the Acts of the Apostles. While different apostles do appear in most of these stories, the only single character who unifies the whole story from beginning to end is Jesus himself, acting directly or through the Spirit. And so the book would more accurately be named The Acts of Jesus and the Spirit. The book's introduction recounts how the risen Jesus spends some 40 days with the disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God. This connects back to the story of Luke's gospel, where Jesus claimed that he was restoring God's kingdom over the world, beginning with Israel. So he called Israel to live under God's reign by following him. And he was enthroned as king when he gave up his life and then conquered death with his love. And so the book of Acts begins with the risen King Jesus instructing his disciples about life in his kingdom. So he promises that the Spirit will soon come and immerse them in his personal presence. And this fulfills one of the key hopes from the Old Testament prophets, that in the Messianic kingdom, God's presence, his Spirit, would come and take up residence among his people in a new temple and transform their hearts. And so Jesus says, when this happens, the Spirit will empower his disciples to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. From here, Jesus is taken up from their sight in a cloud. It's an image drawn from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. It shows how Jesus is now being enthroned as the Son of Man who was vindicated after his suffering and now shares in God's rule over the world. And so he promises that he will return one day. And so the main themes and the design of the book of Acts flow right out of this opening chapter. This is a story about Jesus leading his people by the Spirit to go out into the world and invite all nations to live under his reign. And so the story will begin with that message spreading in Jerusalem and then into the neighboring regions of Judea and Samaria full of non-Jewish people, and then from there out to all of the nations into the ends of the earth. This video is just going to focus on the first half of the book. 
So the Jerusalem focus section begins with Jesus' followers waiting until the Feast of Pentecost when all of these Jewish pilgrims from all over the ancient world were in the city. And the Holy Spirit comes on the disciples as a great wind and something like flames appear over each person's head and together they start announcing and telling stories of God's mighty deeds. And they're speaking in all of these languages that they didn't know before, but all the people gathered there understand perfectly. Now, in order to see what Luke's emphasizing in this story, it's crucial to see the Old Testament roots of all of these images. So first, the wind and the fire is a direct allusion to the stories about God's glorious fiery presence filling the tabernacle and the temple. And it's also connected to the prophetic promises that God would come and live by his spirit in the new temple of the messianic kingdom. And so here in Acts, God's fiery presence comes to dwell not in a building, but in his people. Luke is saying that the new temple promised by the prophets is Jesus' new covenant family, the people of Jesus, which connects to the second thing Luke is trying to say here. So the prophets promised that when God came to dwell in his new temple, he would reunify all the tribes of Israel under the messianic king and that the good news of God's reign would go out and be announced to the nations. Luke describes in detail the international multi-tribe makeup of all of the Israelites who were there at Pentecost and who responded to Peter's message. And so the apostles keep calling Israelites to acknowledge Jesus as their Messiah and thousands upon thousands respond, forming new communities of generosity and worship and celebration. But not everybody's celebrating. From here, Luke shows how Jesus' new family quickly faced hostility from the Jerusalem leaders. With a really beautiful symmetrical design, Luke tells a tale of two temples. So God's new temple, the community of Jesus' followers, they're gathering every day in the temple courts and from house to house. Now, in between those notices are two stories about Peter and the other apostles healing people in the temple courts, only to get arrested by the temple leaders, followed each time by a speech of Peter claiming that Jesus is the true king of Israel. And at the center of all this is a story about Jesus' followers donating property and possessions to a common fund to help the poor which is really cool, but it seems kind of random for Luke to mention it here, until you realize that this was a practice described in the laws of the Torah and was supposed to be happening through the Jerusalem temple and its leaders. So Luke's point here is clear. The new temple of Jesus' community is fulfilling the purpose that God always intended for the Jerusalem temple, to be a place where heaven and earth meet, where people encounter God's generosity and healing presence. And this conflict between the two temples, it culminates in Acts chapter 6 and 7. It's the first wave of persecution. So Jesus' followers, they continue to multiply, requiring more leaders. And one of these, Stephen, he's a bold witness for Jesus in Jerusalem. And he ends up getting arrested and he's accused of speaking against and even threatening the temple. And so Stephen here gives a long speech showing how Israel's leaders have always rejected the messengers God sent them, including Jesus and now his disciples. So the Jerusalem leaders are enraged. They murder Stephen and they launch a wave of persecution against Jesus' followers that drives most of them from the city. But it has a paradoxical effect. Luke shows how this tragedy actually became the means by which Jesus' people are now sent out into Judea and Samaria. Jesus directs his church through the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost was a major event in early Christianity. Its coming had long been prophesied and prepared for anciently. Ancient Israel was commanded to keep on the 50th day, which is Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks or First Fruits. This feast day was to be observed 50 days from the time of the offering of the first sheaf of the barley harvest. Instead of unleavened bread, two loaves of leavened bread were to be offered. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Leavened bread would now be appropriate. Christ, the pure leaven, was resurrected, and the lifting up to an eternal life was available to all who would accept him. There is special meaning to this holy day, which is the day of Pentecost, just as there had been for the Passover feast. After Jesus' 40-day ministry, he considered his disciples nearly ready for the great missionary work that lay before them. 
but certain vital steps remained. He commanded them not to yet leave Jerusalem, but to wait for power from on high, that is, the gift of the Holy Ghost, which would give them power to bear witness throughout all of Judea and even to the ends of the earth. When was this promise realized? The Holy Ghost was bestowed on Pentecost, the Greek name for the 50th day, the 50th day from the offering of that first barley harvest sheaf and of Christ's resurrection. This significant event occurred on the Feast of the First Fruits. On this day, elders of Israel had come up as commanded to, to Jerusalem from many different and distant nations. They had assembled to keep this feast. And on this day, the Holy Ghost was poured forth as cloven tongues of fire. Under the influence of the Holy Ghost, the apostles stood and bore powerful witness that Jesus was the Messiah for whom their people had waited for centuries. The Holy Ghost was given on the day of Pentecost. Because the Holy Ghost, they were able to speak in tongues, and the tongues of those Jews had come from many lands to celebrate the Feast of First Fruits. And because of the power of the Holy Ghost, the hearts of many were penetrated. And on that day, nearly 3,000 persons were baptized. And many of those there went back to their distant lands, bearing witness the Messiah had come. Note that on this day, Israel had been anciently commanded, quote, When ye reap the harvest of your land, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest, Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. That's in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22. So, from the beginning, the Lord had taught and prepared for his gospel to be taken at that time and this time to the spiritually poor and those strangers or Gentiles outside of Israel. The first set of holy days Israel had been commanded to observe taught of Jesus' mission in the meridian of time. That first set of holy days were a witness of Christ's crucifixion, which is the Passover, of his res resurrection, that's the first sheaf, sheaf offering, and of the beginning of his early harvest of souls, that's the feast of first fruits. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endowed with power from on high. That's from the Joseph Smith translation of uh, Luke 24, 49. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, the power from on high, which the apostles were promised by Jesus, also had reference to temple endowments. He says the following, but from Latter-day Revelation, we learned that the Lord had something more in mind in issuing this instruction. In this dispensation, after the elders had received the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Lord began to reveal unto them that he had an endowment in store for the faithful. You read that in D&C, chapter 38, and uh, section 38 and section 43. A blessing such as not known among the children of men. In June of 1833, he said, I give unto you a commandment that you should build a house in the which house I design to endow those whom I have chosen with power from on high, for this is the promise of the Father unto you. Therefore, I command you to tarry, even as mine apostles at Jerusalem. The gift of the Holy Ghost and temple endowments. Thus the apostles or any ministers or missionaries in any age are not fully qualified to go forth preach the gospel, and build up the kingdom unless they have the gift of the Holy Ghost and also are endowed with power from on high, meaning they have received certain knowledge, powers, and special blessings normally given only in the Lord's temple, as from Bruce O. McConkie in his exposition called the Doctrinal New Testament Commentary. He also said, in the days of poverty, or when the number of true believers had, has been small, the Lord has used mountains, groves, and wilderness locations for temple purposes. Endowments, for instance, following the Latter-day Exodus, were first given on Ensign Peak. And that's from his statement in Doctrines of Salvation.
the early saints in the Nauvoo Temple. An estimated 6,000 Latter-day Saints received temple ordinances before the exodus from Nauvoo, President Brigham Young said. Such has been the anxiety manifested by the saints to receive the ordinances of the temple, and such the anxiety on the part on our part to minister to them that I have given myself up entirely to the work of the Lord in the temple night and day, not taking more than four hours sleep upon an average per day and going home but once a week. The strength and power of the temple covenants fortified the saints as they left their city and temple for a journey into the unknown. The power of the Holy Ghost and the power of the endowments changed the apostles from wavering servants to mighty servants. Peter, while seeking to have faith, faith had continually stumbled, such as when he tried to walk on the tempest, tempestuous sea and when he failed to stand with Christ during his great trial. All the other apostles also had faltered. Peter and all the apostles, with the aid of the Holy Ghost, had become apostles of power. They no longer failed in their faith, but walked in faith until they too all suffered death for their testimony of Christ. While John did not suffer a martyr's death, he suffered banishment on the Isle of Patmos and likely many other persecutions. This powerful change in the apostles is the testimony of the truth of the ministry and resurrection of Jesus Christ, their master. He had the power to change their lives and he has the power to change the lives of all who will truly believe and seek to keep his commandments and ordinances and follow his teachings. This is Come Follow Me Lesson 29 for July 10th through the 16th. It's based on Acts chapters 6 through 9, and the theme is What Wilt Thou Have Me to Do? That's from Acts 9, verse 6. If anyone seemed like an unlikely candidate for conversion, it was probably Saul a Pharisee who had a reputation for persecuting Christians. So when the Lord told a disciple named Ananias to seek out Saul and to offer him a blessing, Ananias was understandably hesitant. Lord, he said, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints. But the Lord knew Saul's heart and his potential, and he had a mission in mind for Saul. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So Ananias obeyed, and when he found this former persecutor, he called him Brother Saul. If Saul could change so completely and Ananias could welcome him so freely, then should we ever consider anyone an unlikely candidate for change, including ourselves? The witness of the Holy Ghost is needed. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Baptism of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, by priesthood authority. Joseph Smith said, Baptism by water is but half a baptism, and is good for nothing without the other half. That is, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When Joseph Smith was asked by President Martin Van Buren, what the difference was between the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and other churches in our day, he indicated it was the Holy Ghost. Quote, we consider that all other considerations were contained in the gift of the Holy Ghost, unquote. That's in the documentary history of the church. 
Elder Bruce O'Makaki said, one of the evidences of the great apostasy is that in the main, the churches of Christendom do not so much as claim the power to give a present bestowal of the Holy Ghost, to say nothing of having that divine being respond to such a conferral. The lack of the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost is a sign of loss of true priesthood authority. Immediately after his resurrection, Jesus began to clarify to his disciples how all things in the Old Testament had witnessed of his coming and sufferings. You can read that in Luke chapter 24, verses 25 through 27. Thereafter, they taught using this new understanding. Stephen's powerful testimony was based on how ancient events had witnessed of Jesus Christ and what he would suffer. The Pharisees and Sadducees had rejected Jesus, relying on their ancestral connections to Abraham and Moses. Stephen showed them Abraham's and Moses' lives had actually taught of Jesus Christ. A covenant had been made to Abraham of a promised land. Neither Abraham nor his immediate seed realized that covenant in their mortal lives. But God finally sent Moses to lead them uh, ancient Israel from bondage into the coveted land. However, when Moses came to lead them to this land, some in ancient Israel rejected him as their deliverer. Moses had himself taught that there would be one greater than him who would come and make a greater delivery from bondage than he did. The rejection of Moses foreshadowed the rejection of Jesus Christ. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, who received the lively oracles to give unto us, whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we know not what is become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. It is important to remember the true covenanted land Jesus came to lead them into was eternal life. And the true freedom from bondage was freedom from death and sin. His apostles now understood this truth. Philip also used the Old Testament to testify that ancient prophecies in the Old Testament were now fulfilled through Jesus Christ. He did so by helping the Ethiopian eunuch understand that the prophet Isaiah bore witness of Jesus Christ. And you can read that in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8. Be, ba be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You can all be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. He was crucified, but he rose from the dead. Impossible. Don't listen to him. Why do you resist Jesus? He is your savior. The way to everlasting life. Jesus is dead! And you will go the same way. Blasphemer! No! Jesus is alive. They tried to kill him, but they failed. He is a true prophet. I'm a messiah. What do you know about the prophets? No. Your prophet put himself above the law. This boy knows nothing. I know the scriptures. Really? And you'll know Deuteronomy. Because he sought to entice you away from the Lord, your God. Your hand shall be the first against him, and you shall stone him with stones until he dies!
Stephen's vision contained vital revelation. His vision taught that the Father and Son remain as separate glorified persons. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Joseph Smith said the following, Peter and Stephen testified that they saw the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Any person that had seen the heavens opened knows that there are three personages in the heavens and hold the keys of the power, and one presides over all. I have always declared God to be a distinct personage, Jesus Christ, a separate and distinct personage from God the Father, and that the Holy Ghost was a distinct personage and a spirit. And these three constitute three distinct personages and three gods.